in my opinion, the position we play is the most mentally challenging position on the field. Other than, quarterback is a different beast, right? But we're the only position on the field where we are asked to do our job for 70 plays in a game, but we get rewarded four or five times a game. The best receivers still only get eight to 12 targets a game. That's if you're a fucking monster. If you're one of the best players in the world, the ball's throwing you 12 out of 70 plays. Like that, that's still not a lot. So then how do you stay positive through those other 60 plays? It's the way you talk to yourself. Because we never know when our opportunity's coming. I remember talking to Devontae Adams and there was some Monday night football game. He had like, he had like 80 yards in the first quarter and then didn't get the ball thrown to him again until the fourth quarter. And he was talking about how he was so frustrated second and third quarters, not getting the ball, not getting the ball. If at some point his mental broke down, he ended up then having six catches in the two minute drive and he won the game, right? But, but, but for 40 minutes, he was not involved at all. And if at some point his mental had broken down and, and he stopped taking pride in his craft and he let the details slip, well then he wouldn't have been in the place to have six catches over the last eight plays to win the game. We never know when our opportunity is coming. So, hey, thanks, Coach Lee, for taking the time. Appreciate it. Good stuff. I think the guys are looking forward to hear from you. You know, there are a lot, a lot of, too much of me talking shit to them, so. That's awesome. No, I I <laughs> yeah, I, pre I appreciate you guys having me. Uh, this is exciting for me. I'm a, I've learned a lot about your program over the last, like, three, four months. I met Coach when I was in Germany. Um, we had a nice, a nice talk for about two hours, and. It's been cool to learn about, you know, the whole league and learn about how successful you guys have been. So anything I can do to help, man, this is, this is awesome to get on here with you guys for sure. Um, so we're going to start, we're going to start kind of with some mindset stuff. All right. Well, me and coach were talking and start with kind of like what I believe are the foundations of a great wide receiver as far as the way you approach the game, um, you know, how you handle yourself. And then hopefully at the end, we'll get into some release stuff. I don't think we'll get through all the releases, um, but we'll, I'll introduce some things and then we can kind of build on it from there. Uh, if you guys have questions, uh, I know there's like a chat box. I think you can leave questions. Hopefully it'll pop up or, or just unmute and interrupt me. Like this can be yeah. pretty casual. Um, but all right, let's, we'll get rocking right here. All right, so foundations of a great wide receiver. So this is really what I think, football in general, right? Like this is for coaches, this is for players. Um, I think this particular presentation, I think I was giving to coaches, but for all of us, right? Like football is a really hard game where, where we, we demand a lot out of you. You know, the training is hard. The day-to-day the -day is hard. It's, it's taxing. Like it's, it's a battle of wills. So you got to have a why. The reason why you get up to work every day has to be bigger than yourself. If, it, if you have selfish motives where your why is, is to make yourself look good or to score touchdowns so you can get girls or – to be on TV, whatever it is, if, if your motives are selfish, someone's eventually going to outwork you. Like the, the only way you can really succeed in this game is if you're playing for a purpose bigger than yourself. And I think as coaches, it's important that our purpose is our players. It's not about me as a coach and what play I can draw up or how many great players I can produce. It's about me helping my players reach their goals. But I think as a player, like you got to step onto the field every day, either wanting to prove your legacy, meaning that you're so, you, you really care about, the way you're going to be remembered and, and and you really care about the narrative that's going to be spoken about you after your career. That's pretty powerful, right? When you're playing every day, you know, not just to, to play well this game, but you want to be so great and be so legendary that you're talked about after you leave. That's a pretty powerful why. Or maybe it's to be a role model for your brother or provide for your family or, or whatever it might be. All, all I'm saying is you need to really sit down and think about what motivates me. And it's going to be different for every person, but like, that's gotta be on the top of your mind every day because we can't afford to have it. Like there, in the NFL, when you're at the highest level in, 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 in the States, you have, if you're not a fucking great player and you have one day where you're unmotivated, you'll lose your job. Like it's that cut and dry. Like if you come in one day and your why isn't on the top of your mind and, and you are a little bit less motivated or you don't feel like being there and you have one fucking bad day, that could be the last day you ever have in the NFL. That, that's how short the margin for error is. So like those guys, you hear them talking like, the way they the way they operate is is, is just they're, they're so obsessed with you know providing for their mother providing for their family building a legacy like whatever it is um and i think through that right through playing this game for something bigger than yourself even if it is to leave a legacy right and let's say you don't leave the legacy that you want to do let's say you want to be remembered as the greatest player ever it doesn't that doesn't doesn't happen the the, the lessons that you'll learn in the pursuit of that 
will allow you to do everything, anything you want for the rest of your life. And that's why I said at the bottom, football is a vehicle that can change the world. I think the lessons we learn in this game and the way we sacrifice for each other and, and the selflessness and the toughness and the grit, all those things, those are, le- those are lessons you'll learn that, that I think if we could teach those to the world, then we could change the world with that. And I think similarly, like if you can, can learn, can pick up those traits, it, you know, it, you'll be invincible the rest of your life because you'll be able to do whatever you want going forward. Um, you know, and, and like, that's really it for me. Like, like the reason why I start sideline hustle, it, it's really, it, it really is because I think that doing things like this, right. I got 14 guys from another country on zoom with me and it, it's, a, it's because of the game of football, right. That allow me to spread my message and allow me to maybe make a 1% difference in your life. And then you can affect somebody else. Like that's, I think how we can change the world with this. And, and it, it goes on to still part of your why, right. Like even, me talking about it. I'm not talking about really anything about me. It's just so much bigger than me. And that's what motivates me every day. I'm so fucking hungry every day because I really feel like this is so much bigger than me. And you guys got to try to find a way to, to have that similar feeling for your own craft um, where it's not just about you. And, and if it's just about you, man, it's going to get old after a while. You know, it's got to be, there's got to be more to it. Um, and then once you find that purpose, walk in it every day, right? For example, if you're going to tell me, coach, I want to leave a legacy. I want to be the greatest receiver in Frankfurt history. Well, then you better wake up and be the greatest fucking receiver in Frankfurt history every day. Right? Don't tell me. Otherwise, it's just meaningless words that, 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 that are all bullshit. Like, don't tell me you want to be something and then you don't, you don't walk in that purpose every day. So whatever it is you decide, if you decide you're going to be a role model for your family and use football to show that, then you better live every moment of your life as that role model. There's no, there's no you know, it, it, what you do all the time, you know, what you do some of the time is how you do things all the time, right? Whatever you allow yourself to do on a daily basis decision, that, that's how you're allowing yourself to live your life. So if you, if you live your life with discipline and you live your life with tenacity and you live, you live your life the right way, then, then that will be who you are. But it's from all those little decisions, you're going to walk in that purpose every single day. All right. The culture that, that we've created, and again, if, if there's questions or I'm talking too fast, just, just stop me. This can be, I'll get, I'll get rolling pretty good, but this can be casual. You guys can, can, can stop me at any point. Uh, the culture we've created with, with every player I've ever coached, right? From the cool thing I think we've done is we have one culture, one theme for what we do from the, the 10 year olds I coach, the youth kids I coach up until Mohamed Sanu and Philip Lindsay and all the NFL guys I coach. And the theme is this, the theme is love each other, lead each other, dominate. Right. Our first job as teammates, my first job as a coach is to love you and your job is to love each other. Right. And have each other's backs. That's part of our why being bigger than ourselves. It's about each other. It's about fighting for the brother next to me. So my first obligation is just to genuinely love my brother and build a connection with him. And and and, and really just like, like once you have that bond, you have that love that becomes hard to break. And, and that motivates you to fight harder. Now, once you've established all right, we love each other, we're in this together. Now, it ha- now you have to lead each other, right? How can I tell you that I love you? How can I look you in the eye and say, yo, I love you, but then I'm not willing to hold you accountable and force you to play at your highest level? That's leadership, right? I don't really love you if I allow you to walk around and be less than your best. Then I just pretend to love you, but then I'm allowing you to be shitty. When I know you have greatness inside you, I just need to have the balls to lead you, right? So love each other, lead each other. And then once we do that, it's time to go out and dominate. I don't care how good your culture is. I don't care how much fucking love you guys have for each other. It's a performance-based business, right? You can, have the, you can have the tightest knit receiver group in the world. If you don't fucking go out and perform, you guys all suck. And it doesn't matter how fucking, how close you are, any of that shit. Like, at the end of the day, this is about performance. It's about going out in the field and fucking dominating, executing our job. And I think it's easy to let this shit become cute and think that it's about all these other things. Culture's important. You know, love for your players is important. Love for each other. Your why, all those things are important. But the bottom line is you got to go fucking produce. Like I get questions all the time. Hey, coach, how do I get colleges to notice me? How do I get this? Like, if people aren't noticing you, you're probably not good enough. You know what I'm saying? Like, if, like, like bottom line, this is like, film doesn't lie. No matter where, people don't miss players anymore. There's players from Germany getting recruited. There's players from around the world getting recruited. Like, is it harder for you guys to get noticed? Sure. Like, but it's, it's not impossible, right? There are players that look like you that come from where you come from getting noticed. If you're not one of them, the answer is not some secret fucking camp to go to. The answer is not that you're getting screwed. The answer is you need to go back and fucking play better and work harder and figure out how to put on a better performance, right? So I think that's just an important part of this. And, you know, I elaborate on some of these things I said, like love is accountability, love is brotherhood, love is understanding. It's difficult. Like 
loving each other, truly loving each other is hard and there's going to be ups and downs, but knowing that my brother who's going to war with me has my best interest in, at heart is empowering. And that makes me want to fight for that guy. Um, and then again, once the love is established, like what you guys got to understand about leadership, if you want to be like, I know you guys haven't beaten Shwebish Hall in a long time, right? If you guys want to fucking get over that hump and beat them, you have to realize that process is going to be fucking uncomfortable, right? Like you are inherently as a leader, you guys are right here right now. And you're trying to drag each other up to here. That's an uncomfortable process. Walking uphill with a fucking sled tied to your back is uncomfortable, right? Like that's what this is. There's nothing easy about it. So like when you're in a situation where you know one of your brothers is not giving his best and it makes you uncomfortable and you decide not to say something, you're failing your brother, right? You're failing him. You're allowing him to be less than his best. And he is then getting worse and developing bad habits. They're going to cost you a football game down the road. Whereas you need to understand now it's going to be uncomfortable. So when I am in a situation that makes me uncomfortable, that's how it's supposed to be. So I can't run from that feeling. I have to embrace the fact that leadership is uncomfortable. Leadership is confrontational all of the time. Like I'm always fucking angry as a coach because I'm always confronting people and always trying to fucking push them to do more. There's nothing. I'm never, I'm never happy. I'm never fucking satisfied because for me to be satisfied is for me to be a shitty coach. Like coaches can't ever be satisfied. I don't care if I'm coaching fucking Julio Jones. I'm still going to find a way to not be satisfied and ask him to give me more. Um, and I think, you know, once you show up to work every day with that work ethic, once you show up every day and, and you are the example of what it means to work hard and do your job, it is now your responsibility to demand that from everybody else. You have to live it first, right? You can't be a fucking guy just talking and saying, yo, fucking run harder. And then you're coming in 17th place in sprints. Then you're just a phony and no one wants to fucking hear from you. But when you are the example of it, and you are living your, your truth and walking in your purpose every day. And when you say, hey, I want to leave a legacy, and you're actually working every day to leave a legacy, then you can demand that from your teammates and they will, they will respect that. All right. Um, and I think, you know, the dominant part, right? Like, I know you guys have a rich culture and a rich history um, in Germany. Like, I think the cool thing is about our, like, dub RU culture with Sideline Hustles, we call it, is like, my 12-year-old, my, my, like, Mohamed Sanu knows who my best youth line is. Like, I talk to them about everyone, right? So it's like this one big family. So Again, it's a performance-based business. But if you do all these things right and you come out in the field and fucking ball out, like, you'll be a legend. You'll be a fucking legend, like, like in our group. And with you guys, too, you're one of the top teams in Germany. If, you're, if you have one of the best seasons in Frankfurt Galaxy history, you're going to be a fucking legend in German football just because of the level you're at. So it's like if you're a 14-year-old training with Sideline Hustle and you do your job and perform, like, Mohamed Sanu is going to hear about that shit. Philip Lindsay's going to hear about that shit. Like you can be a fucking legend but you don't, you don't become a legend because you fucking ran around a cone and look cute. You become a legend because you make fucking plays in a game situation when the ball is thrown to you. So, so understand that difference, right? All the cone drills, all the technique, like it's all great and it can all help you. But like, I can't teach you how to be a fucking baller. Either you got it or you don't. I can't teach you how to be fucking tough, how to be a dog. Like that's decisions you got to make yourself again. But if you do all that and you perform, you can fucking do some shit that'll never be forgotten. Um, and I think this is one that I really take on as a coach. And I think that, you know, I think coaches should take on, but also you got, let's say one of you guys listening to this, you consider yourself a, the leader of the room, right? You're the captain of the room. You're then the general, right? There are no bad soldiers. They're only bad generals. So, so the minute I, as a general, I start blaming my players, well, A, it takes accountability away from what I can do better because ultimately your performance is my job and my responsibility. Um, but, but B, it just, it, it, it heals the culture. Like we can't start pointing fingers, right? Take, take ownership for, for your partner, and if, if you are the leader of the group, then everything is your fault, right? Everything is your fault. You set the tone, and it's on you to demand more from each other. And if you all have the attitude where I'm not pointing fingers, somebody drops a ball, and you blame yourself, thinking, what could I have done better to have helped him make that catch? How Could I have gotten extra work with him after practice? Could I have told him to focus a little bit? Like, when, we all, when you all have that mindset that it's on me, that his, my teammates catch was my fault because I could have encouraged him to stay after practice for another five minutes. Like when you all have that attitude, like you, you'll never fail because you're all working towards helping each other, supporting each other. And they're not pointing fingers. Right. And in, in, in my culture, there are only two, there are only two uh, traits that you must have to play. You have to have great attitude, great effort. You don't have to be fast. You don't have to be strong. You don't have to be tall, nothing physically. You have to show up every day with a great attitude meaning that you are willing and excited to learn and you have to give your best. That's what great effort is. Great effort doesn't mean fucking giving more than the next guy, the guy next to you doesn't mean more. It just means giving your absolute best, right? So whatever that is, and, and only you know that, right? You're the one who has to lay your head on the pillow 
at the end of every day and look yourself in the mirror and know, did I give my best or not? And, and I can't answer that for you. Coach can't answer that for you. Like, like you fucking know at the end of the day, whether you're a, a real badass or you're a fraud. And, and that will, trust me, when the fucking ball is snapped and in between those white lines, we're going to find out real quick which one you are. You're not going to be able to hide at that point. Right? But, but, but every day, if you show up with great attitude and great effort, which don't take any skill, they don't, that doesn't take any talent. Attitude and effort are a choice. Right? So, so get your mind ready. Get your mindset right. And you have to give great attitude and great effort every single day. Everything else is, is on me is how I look at it as a leader. But again, so as, as a leader for you guys, if you can just demand attitude and effort from your teammates, then like coach will take care of the rest and teach you what you got to, what, what you got to learn. And you guys will encourage each other to learn all this shit, but, but nothing will be accomplished without those two things. All right. And then let me just see if I have this real quick. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All right. Yeah, we do. All right. So now this is a, a quote that I really love. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt, a U.S. president, um, said this, and I know LeBron James talks about it a lot, but, but this is one that we really base, you know, kind of our mindset on. Um, it's not the critic who counts, not, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who's actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes up short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming. You know, it goes on and says that the worst if he fails, he, he at least fails by daring greatly. And, and it's the same thing I was just saying, right? Like, I don't give a fuck if you show up tomorrow and drop five balls. I don't care if you run the route a hundred times, run the wrong route a hundred times. Like, all that can be fixed. You just need to show up and fucking fight. You're not allowed to not show up. If you don't show up, you don't, you're not allowed to be part of this team, right? That, that's the non-negotiable agreement that, like, we are going to agree to show up every day and fucking fight. And my, my, my fight that I have in me might not be, you know, as good as it was yesterday, but I'm giving you my best on this day. And, and if we can have that agreement, that I'm going to show up and just fucking fight, no matter what that looks like, I might be exhausted. My girlfriend might have just broke up with me. I might have family. Like, there's all shit we have going on. We're all grown men. But that's still, none of it is an excuse not to fucking show up. When you're not showing up, you're really fucking failing your teammates. At least showing up and fighting, and whatever that means to you, that will go a long way. And that, that attitude where it's not okay to ever fucking give in, it's not okay to ever not fight, that's going to show up on third and one in a crucial situation. That's going to show up in a two-minute drill to go win a game. Like, that, that attitude is, it carries over to everything you do where it's, it's never okay for me not to show up and fight. And as long as you're willing to fucking fight, like, and you keep fighting, you're, you're going you're gonna to come out, you know, eventually. Um, this is just a good way we define toughness, right? Everyone always wants to talk about fucking toughness. But then you say like, hey, be tough. And no one really, what does that mean? Like, how do you be tough? You know I mean, no one really ever defines that. To me, toughness goes hand in hand with consistency, right? That's why that word is boldness. So to me, toughness is the ability to show up with great attitude and great effort, but it's consistently. You're not tough if you show up with great attitude and great effort for one day and then the next day you don't. You're just a fraud. You're a phony. Even if you show up, even if you show up with toughness for 10 days in a row, but then the 11th day you don't, then you're not tough. Toughness means you do it every single fucking day without fail. And no one needs to pull it out of you. No one needs to beg you for it. It's just who the fuck you are. You're tough. So I don't do anything other than I show up and I give my best every single chance I have, no matter what the circumstances are. All right. Um, with all that, I, and this probably should be the first slide when I think about it. All of this starts firstly, with how you're talking to yourself. And we're going to get into very specific receiver situations here in a second. But I can't, like, let's go back, right? I can't have a why, a good why, if I'm not talking to myself the right way. If I don't have positive thoughts going through my head, if I'm not motivated, right? I can't be a leader to my teammates if I'm not first leading myself, right? If I'm not first at peace with myself and feel good about the way I'm leading, living my life, and if I'm not confident in myself and, and have positive things running through my head first, I can never influence somebody else to be great. If I don't feel great about myself, I'll never be able to make someone else feel great. So it first starts with how are you talking to yourself, right? And, and it also then, so not only leadership, all that, but like performance. And, in the, and this is something I say all the time that no one fucking thinks about. In the high pressure situation, there's a minute and 20 seconds left on the clock. You're down by four and you're on the opposing team's 30 yard line. You go to 70 yards to win the game. In that situation, I'm not looking for the players that can jump the, the highest or run the fastest. I'm looking for the players that are poised, that can execute their job. Because if you have all the physical skills, but you don't have poise, you're, you're going to fuck up and make a crucial mistake because the, the moment's going to get too big for you. So before any of our physical traits matter, I have to be able to calm my mind, 
and talk to myself the right way when 60,000 people are yelling at me, when we're about to beat Schwabish Hall for the first time and I feel nervous, when, when whatever the fuck all these things are that can make the, the moment bigger than what it is, you got to be able to block out all that and just go back to playing football, which is a simple game, right? A hitch route is a hitch route, whether you're running it with a minute and 20 seconds left in the fucking Super Bowl or you're running it in a drill tomorrow on a grass field. A comeback is a comeback, like simplify the moment and just focus on doing your job. And that is poise. That's being able to talk to yourself the right way in a crucial moment when there's quote unquote pressure. Okay. And, and, and I think that, you know, you must be, and I think the mistake people make is they think like, oh, you're lucky. You're just a positive person or you had a better upbringing or like, whatever. like, fuck that. You train this shit relentlessly, right? Like I didn't, I wasn't just born this way. Like I work every day. To, to get myself into a good place so that I can spread this message. But it starts with my own self-care and I am relentless about controlling my own attitude and talking to myself the right way. Like when I have negative thoughts going through my head, I fucking stop everything I'm doing until I figure out a way to work them out and get them out of my head. Because I know that if I'm walking around with negativity, I'm getting 70% of my potential. And I don't want to fucking, I, I'd rather stop everything until I get back to 100% and I'm in the right place than go through the motion to 70%. So you got to care for yourself and make sure you're in a good place first. And then once you are, you can start influencing your teammates. Um, and this is how it applies specifically to receivers, right? In my opinion, the position we play is the most mentally challenging position on the field. Other than, quarterback is a different beast, right? But we're the only position on the field where we are asked to do our job for 70 plays in a game, but we get rewarded four or five times a game, right? Every other position, like if you're a cornerback and you never get the ball thrown to you, that means you're doing your job. You can feel good every time the ball is not thrown to you. If you're a left tackle, like every other person's job, you can do your job and, and, and influence the game on every play. For us, we have to have the ball thrown to us for the most part. You know what I'm saying? We have to have the ball in our hand. And think about how many things need to go right for that to happen. You can run a great route every single play and still not get the ball because the quarterback doesn't look your way or there's a bad snap or it's a bad throw or it's a bad read. Like there's so many fucking things that need to happen before the ball ends up in our hands that we can drive ourselves crazy. If, if you're – if the value that you place on yourself is only based on performance, right? If the only way you think you're successful is if you have 10 catches and 120 yards and a touchdown, then very rarely are you going to be successful in your mind because it's a pretty fucking unbelievable performance to have 10 catches, 120 yards and a touchdown. Like really only the best of the best of the best do that. And even those guys who are the DeAndre Hopkins, the Mike Thomases of the world, they still look at this. Like the best receivers still only get eight to 12 targets a game. That's if you're a fucking monster. If you're one of the best players in the world, the ball's thrown to you 12 out of 70 plays. Like that, that's still not a lot. So then how do you stay positive through those other 60 plays? It's the way you talk to yourself, right? And it's why like me as a receivers coach, like I understand why receivers are hotheads, why receivers are, are divas, why receivers want attention. Like if I did my job well every single fucking day and never got a pat on the back except for once every 70 reps, well, when that fucking happened, I'd want to showboat and draw attention to myself and get the credit I feel like I deserve too. Like it's human nature. So I think it's okay to be that way, but then it becomes your culture in, in the, the Frankfurt galaxy receiver room. If we can't, if, if we, if we're not going to place value on production, what are we placing value on? It's your technique. It's the way you play the game. Every snap it's yeah, sure. I have a backside black on the block on this run play, but I know that if I don't block, make this block as best as I can, I'm going to get chewed the fuck out in this meeting and I'm going to be humiliated in a way as if it's the most important thing in the world, right? And that way, in the same way as I know that if I do make this block, coach is going to celebrate me just as hard as he would if someone scored an 80-yard 80, 80 touchdown. And when you start to just value doing your job, like scoring a touchdown and doing your job that way is no more valuable than making a block and doing your job. Like doing your job is doing your job. So you celebrate just the details of your job. How great of a run blocker can you be on this play? How great of a... You're running the guy off first, man. I'm taking the best fucking release I can take. And you know what? If you do take a great release, coach is going to – and even though you didn't get the ball thrown to you and it was a meaningless play, coach is going to show that play and highlight the progress you're making and highlight the effort you're putting in, and that's going to establish what we value in this room. But at the receiver position, like, you have to coach every single detail. You have to value every single detail. You have to take pride in every single detail because we never know when our opportunity is coming. I remember talking to Devontae Adams, and there was some Monday night football game. He had, like – he had like 80 yards in the first quarter and then didn't get the ball thrown to him again until the fourth quarter. And he was talking about how he was so frustrated second and third quarters, not getting the ball, not getting the ball. If at some point his mental broke down, he ended up then having six catches in the two minute drive and he won the game. 
right? But, but, but for 40 minutes, he was not involved at all. And if at some point his mental had broken down and, and he stopped taking pride in his craft and he let the details slip, well, then he wouldn't have been in a place to have six catches over the last eight plays to win the game. We never know when our opportunity is coming, right? There could, be a, there could be that route, right? Like the fucking outside fade route. It's never thrown in practice. It's never thrown in practice. Coach might even tell you, hey, you're never getting the ball here. And then you decide to believe that shit, right? You decide to believe, hey, this ball's never been thrown. I'm just going to jog. And then that fucking one game, they bust the coverage and you're wide open and you're not expecting the ball because you're thinking of all this other shit besides just doing your job. And now the, one, now the difference is, had you made that play to win the game, they would build a fucking statue of you outside. Instead, you're getting cut the next day, right? Like, just because you, you decided it wasn't important to, to do your job on that play. Just because you decided, hey, you know what? I'm good here. I'm going to slack off a little bit. There comes your opportunity. You weren't, you weren't ready to take advantage of it, and you went from a fucking hero to a zero just like that. And that's how careers are changed, guys. There are players that, that make 12-year careers in the NFL because they decided to be ready for that one play. And there's a guy who's just as good or maybe better than that guy with a 12-year career, and he decided to slack off during that opportunity, and no one ever called him again. That's how thin the margin is, and that's why, like, your mental – is so important at this position. You will not, don't expect a pat on the back. Don't look for a pat on the back. Just take pride in being a fucking savage and torturing DBs because DBs fucking suck and we all hate them. Just make their lives fucking miserable and obsess yourselves with that and, and, and the results will come. When we start thinking about results, when we start worrying about touchdowns, we start worrying about the pictures I can post on Instagram and all the other bullshit you guys like to worry about, you, you, your mind's not in the right place and you have to be aggressive about controlling your mental. And, you know, the third one is, is, I think, more for coach, coach. And something I think getting no coach, he does a great job of. But the only way I know how to coach the receiver position, in my opinion, right, the minute you become soft on receivers, like, I, it's just playing into all the dark side of the position, right? The minute I let a, something slip up or, hey, hey, you know, that's okay that you were doing, like, fuck that. You got to, like, you have to love your players hard and coach them fucking hard. And I am going to motherfuck you when you miss a block the same way that I would when you drop a ball. And I'm going to hug you and celebrate you. When you make a block, the same way I would when you catch a ball. They're, they're, they're no different. Just doing your job is non-fucking negotiable, and those who do it the best will play, period. And I think, again, when, when those standards are here, and there's, what do you got? What do we have, 15 guys in this call? When you have the standards here, and there's 15 guys making sure that nobody falls below this, and everyone raises their standard up here, that's what the championship is. But when coach's standard is here, and your best player's standard is here, and then everyone else is kind of down here, that's, that's not championship culture. We all have to be fucking supporting each other to bring everybody up to here. And when someone's not doing that, it's not fucking okay. It's not a laughing matter like, ha ha, David's just having a bad day. Or ha, ah, you know, his, like, fuck that, bro. It's not, I'm out here busting my ass. You, I, I don't know, you guys been watching this Michael Jordan documentary on ESPN? You nice. see, that's how he was. He was not, he, he would rather fucking die than allow somebody to not give their best around him. He would rather fucking drop dead. Like he had so much pride in the way he carried himself and the way he led his teammates. He would literally rather be in a fucking coffin than allow anybody to say that Michael Jordan did not demand the best of his teammates. That's how much it mattered to him. And yeah, you saw him crying, right? Because it was hard. Leadership is uncomfortable and confrontational all the time. He was crying over the fact that people thought he was a bad teammate. But he said, you know what? If you think that way, you've never fucking won anything. If you think I was a bad teammate, that's because you've never fucking won anything. Ask anyone who I played with, and they will all say I was a great teammate because I never asked them to do anything I didn't do myself. And obviously, it fucking worked. They won six championships, never lost when they got to the finals. But, like, you're talking about the greatest player, the most relentless fucking savage of all time. It was so hard for him to be a leader that at 60 years old, he's crying about that shit. That's how emotionally draining it was. So, like, for you guys to think it's going to be a fun, fun, easy, ha-ha process to, to go beat Schwaber's Hole, it's fucking not. Like, the reason you guys haven't fucking beaten them is because you haven't put yourself through enough shit. That it doesn't matter to you enough yet. Even if you think it does. Even if it mattered to you enough, you would have fucking won it by now because I know you guys are talented enough. Like, that's it. Like, it, just, it has to fuck. Like, it, it has to be what you eat, breathe, and sleep. Like, that's it. There's no other way around it. If you want something like that to change. And, that, and that's got to be. And, even, and you can look at me and say, and I don't really know. I'm just projecting. Right? I don't really know how you guys feel about the game. But. My thought is if it's something you've wanted for that long and you've fallen short that long and you believe you're talented enough, then you've got to find a way for it to matter more. Somehow losing has to hurt more to get over that hump. Somehow it's, it's got to not be okay to get over that hump. Like whatever it is you've been doing and you've been falling this short, then it, it, it's got to be different, right? To take that, you can't keep doing the same thing and expect a different result or you're just banking on them to have like an off year 
fuck that. Like, I want to I want to take it from them when they're at their fucking best, not wait for them to lose a great player or well, like, I want to take it from them when they're at their fucking best because I wanted it more. What did they do? At, what did the Bulls do after they lost the 94, 95 season? They didn't go on vacation. What did they say? The next fucking day we were in the gym and we knew it was going to be different and they won three state championships. It's got to be that sort of moment for you guys where it's like, yo, enough is a fucking enough, right? There, and I'm sure you can all think of right now one or two or three little things in the program or within your room that you all kind of allow to happen that if you look, think about it right now, oh, man, if we, if we fix those, you know, maybe that's making the three-point difference or maybe that would – whatever that is, I'm sure there's a few things or a few players that slack off or whatever – it, it, it's those little things. That's how small the percentage is. That's how small the percentage is. And, and get all those things up, and that commitment to excellence will, will play out. All right, any questions on the mentality stuff? Um, the next thing is like kind of everyday drills, but I want to get into releases uh, before that. Thanks for and, mentioning for the shot a couple of times. So I'm mad, I'm mad right now. So. Say that again? I'm mad right now. Yeah, good. Should I shot too much? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> but like you know i think i think from what i understand right you guys are pretty much like that's really the only thing holding you back you guys have done pretty well like that's like the one fucking thorn in your side otherwise otherwise from what i understand you guys have a great program who's done great things won a lot of great games there's just one fucking thorn in your side the same way the pistons were for the bulls and there was that there was that commitment to that that collective commitment it wasn't just michael jordan willing his team it wasn't just phil jackson saying hey i'm here now it was everybody buying in from the fucking from Steve Kerr to the 12th guy on the bench to everyone buying in. And, and I think that that's got to be the attitude to create culture always wins, guys. Culture will always beat talent, right? So, so don't try to – you can't – and you can't control the talent, right? The talent you have is God-given. The talent in this, in this room, you can't, you can't control. You can't go find a new player. You can maximize the talent that's in this room by working hard and staying together, and you can build a culture that's unbreakable so that when the time gets tough, you execute and you fucking outwill them and you out tough them or whoever it is you're playing. Um, I think the last thing, the last, the last thing to talk about is, is finish, right? I think to me, so, so as we say, we just laid a blueprint for, let's say kind of the mentality we want to build a culture, how this should feel. How do I know if we're doing it right? Like, how do I know if fucking guys are bought in the way you display your commitment to your team is the way you finish. When I have 22 guys in the field playing as hard as they fucking can until the echo of the last whistle, like, I know I have a hungry fucking team. When I get a team who, as soon as the whistle's blown, they're slowing up and they're not playing hard through the whistle, like, the way you finish, the way you play the game, I talk about this all the time, and Coach Guido mentioned this to me as something we want to talk about. So in, in, the, in the 1920s and 30s, right, so when you, there, there were si silent movies were introduced to the, to the United States, right? And in the 19, so silent movies, it was kind of like a, a band, right? So like the way like a, a, a band goes on tour, they would go from Cincinnati to Los Angeles to all these different, all these different cities. Silent movies are the same way. They go from one city to the next. And when they were in that city, they, every show would sell out. They would line the block, line the block and stand in line to see a movie with no sound. Why the fuck would people want to spend all this money and all this time to see a movie with no sound? Because I don't need to hear you talk to know what you're about. I don't need to hear you say a word to know how you feel, to know how you're carrying yourself, to know what, to know, to know who you are as a person, right? And in football, especially, there's two things you have in this game. In the game of football as a player, there's two things you have, your word and your film, right? Your word meaning when you say something, when you tell me something and you say you're going to do something, does that actually mean anything? A lot of people can fucking talk and say, hey, I want to be the greatest player ever. I want to leave a legacy. Are you actually working and fucking standing by your word? right? So you have your word and then your film. Like as a, as a coach, I am judging your character. I'm judging the way your father raised you based on the way you play on film because it's a performance-based industry, right? So, I, so if football really matters to you and you were raised the right way, then, I'm, then you should be playing harder than everybody else because there's only one, play to, one way to play this game. The minute I see that, I start, I start judging your family. I start judging the way you were raised. I start judging what kind of person you are. Like it's a silent movie. And guess what? It's not a fucking romantic comedy. This isn't a feel-good fucking ha-ha movie. It's, it's got to be a fucking murder movie. There's got to be blood and guts and fucking bodies on the ground. If, if, it, if it's not a fucking violent movie, you're playing the wrong game. Go play fucking badminton. Go play golf. Those are some cute movies that you can laugh and watch with your girlfriend. This is the fucking bloodiest, goriest, shit, like, most terrible movie you've ever seen because you're out to fucking kill. Like, there's only one way to play. So I think how do you – how do you – Give that narrative you want to give in your silent movie, you finish the right way. 
I know, a, I know if a kid's fucking tough, if he's the last guy playing. I know this kid wants to win if he, play, if he has the most energy on the field and he's helping his teammates up and his body language is positive. He's not sulking. He's not looking at the ground. He's not separating himself from his teammates. Like, I know what type of person you are if I just watch you walk around the field. You're all giving away that silent movie and everyone's always watching. Could be guys be like, oh, coach screwed me this, coach screwed me that. No, you know what? He's probably watching your silent movie over and over and over and say, I'm sick of watching this fucking pussy shit. I need someone who's going to fucking kill somebody because I came here to see a horror film. And if you didn't, like, you're, again, you're, you're, you bought tickets to the wrong movie. And, and I think that's something you guys got, got, got to really think about. Like, and I think in life, right? Like, like, your life is a silent movie. Like, if someone was always watching you and your movie ended today, is it going to tell a story you'd be proud of? May not tell the, like, if you died tomorrow, it might not tell the complete story, but would the story of your life tell a story you would be proud of? Is the narrative something that represents the person you want to be? And I'm guessing a lot of you probably not, because it's fucking hard. There's too many moments in my life that I can look back on and say, fuck, I wish I, wish I represented myself better. But you can't live in regret. You can't, you can't beat yourself up for it. All you can do is just make the next scene a fucking murder movie and, and, you know, and, and hand yourself the right way. And not everything in your life obviously needs to be a murder movie, but in between the white lines, it has to be. It fucking has to be. Um, I think just a, a few ways to define finish. It's just so like, because again, it's kind of like toughness. It's really just to say finish, but like, let's define it, right? Having dominant control of your man at the end of the play, meaning you are dominating him, not the other way around. You are in dominant control. Arriving at the ball with a violent purpose, right? Not jogging into the ball. Like you're fucking coming there with the intention of doing damage, right? And then playing through the echo of the whistle. I should never have to ask you to keep playing or to play harder or to finish. You should be so focused, relentlessly focused about doing your job. You don't even hear a fucking whistle and they got to peel you off the guy. You're running your poster out until you run through the fucking tunnel in the end zone because you still think the ball is coming. You're fucking finishing your block until the ball is snapped to the next fucking play because all you're thinking about is ruining this kid's life. And, and it's that sort of focus, that, that sort of mental energy that like, again, right? I'm not talking about worrying about fucking, you know, what play. You can't worry about what play is called. You can't even worry about whether or not coach puts you in the game. Again, you might play one play. And that one play, you make a huge play for the team. And now, you, now the one play, everyone thinks you're the fucking hero. And meanwhile, you're like, for 69 out of 70 plays, I didn't do shit but there's a statue outside of me because I made one play and lives can change over this shit. Like the ball bounces and lives change. The ball bounces one way or the other way and lives fucking change. The ball's in the air and I either come down with it or I don't and lives fucking change. And when you don't come down to it, where's your mind? When you don't come down with that opportunity, your mind is going to go to all the chances you had to prepare yourself better. And you're going to live with regret because you're going to go back to fuck. You know what? Coach leaves one on this rant, and I didn't do anything about, about, about making my teammates better. Coach leaves one on this rant, and I never encourage anybody to get extra work. I, I, you know, I went on this Zoom call, and like, 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 it's just got to fucking matter. Like, that's it. And, and you know, I think, I think of all the technique shit, like, that's why I love these conference calls and shit, because of all the technique stuff I put on Instagram, unfortunately, I can't build an Instagram page, like, about this stuff. It's, it's hard. I have to put the flashy route running stuff in the technique, but, like, that shit really doesn't matter. There's so much technique. Like, obviously it matters, but this, this has to come first. Great technique. There's, you know, I had that post the other day, like, like, you know, there's nothing passive about being a great wide receiver, right? Like there isn't. So like, like great technique without the fucking dog inside you, like you're just a fucking flag football player. You're just a fucking, a, a, a cute guy who likes to fucking look good on Instagram and, and, you know, wear the Jersey and everything. But like, if you go and fucking win us a championship, like there's only one way to do that. And I think, you know, and I think the last thing is like, be, the last thing I'd say with this and the thing I've learned in my coaching career is, is be yourself. I've become a better leader and I've become better the more I've just tried to be myself. I think as a, early in my career as a coach, I felt like, I, and I'm a yeller, I'm an aggressive guy. Like I get, I, I really believe in, I, I really believe in creating chaos in practice, right? I believe, I, so like the way I, I, the way I build my culture is I, I really am an older brother to my players. Um, or even younger brother to some of my NFL guys, but I'm, I'm a brother, right? Where I build that love, I build that trust. But then, you know, because like once that trust and love is built, I fucking then can push you so hard and I make it so that the players are afraid of letting me down, right? And once they're afraid of, of letting me down, then I can, I can push them as hard as I want. So I think like first, I, you know, I, I, and once we have that, that bond and that relationship the way you guys have, and you know, it's out of love, then you don't have to worry about like, oh, did I rub him the wrong way with this or that? You don't have to worry about mincing words. Like that's your brother. You know it's love. You know we're here for a goal. And I'm just gonna be very fucking direct about what I'm saying. But but again, it's to be yourself. Like 
the more I've embraced there, I've gone to certain schools where coaches have told me, you got to yell less, you got to be less. And that, that wasn't myself. And I went to other schools where I like tried to be more of a fucking yeller than I should have been. Cause I thought I had to prove a point and just, I'm my best when I am myself. So if you're not a vocal guy, doesn't mean you have to yell and scream to your teammates, but it doesn't also mean that like you're excused from talking at all. Just cause you say, um, like, listen, there's no such thing as lead by example. Like that's fucking bullshit. We should all be leading by example. That's our fucking job is to work hard. What does lead by example it means you show up every day and work hard. Like, like, great. So does everybody else in the world. Like that, you don't get a fucking handout for that. There's no such thing as leading by example. That's all fucking excuse. So, but even if you're not a vocal guy, it doesn't mean that you, you get to not talk. Sure. You don't have to stand up in front of the team and talk, but you better find a way of quietly putting your arm around a guy and saying, yo, you're, you're not fucking giving it to me today. I need more from you. Go watch the way I run the sprint. You got to try and match me. Like there's other ways to lead besides getting in front of guys and yelling. And whatever that style is for you, find it. But there's nothing that t- you being shy, you being you know an introvert, none of that shit excuses you not being a leader. You're not allowed to not be a leader. And if you're okay with not being a leader, you're okay with losing a fucking one big game every year. If any of this shit is okay, then that means you're you're okay with fucking having the same result year after year after year after year. If you want things to change, and none of this shit can fucking be okay. Um, any questions before I move on to releases that we got like, you know, 15 minutes ish. You guys good? Nobody. Cool. All right. So we'll start pretty broad. Um, and Guido, I think I will end, we'll at least get to the release commandments. I'm, I'm guessing I probably, I don't think it makes sense to go through specific releases today because I don't want to confuse them, but I think to get the broad understanding of releases and whatnot, and then and then next time we can narrow it down into the specific yeah. stuff. Maybe I can send you a film or whatever. Yeah, let's do it. So, so at the line of scrimmage, guys, press releases are the hardest things for coaches to coach, right? Because when we learn how to run a curl route, a curl route is a curl route no matter what. Like, like that's your, you get the 12 yards, you have a specific footwork pattern, like a break point and you get out of it, right? Like it's kind of always looks the same as, as in a release. Like I can't tell you, Hey, use this release here. Use that release there. Cause I don't know how the DB is going to play me. Right. So in a lot of ways, route running is like a play, right? Like, you know, there's scripted lines, one come after the other. You, you kind of know what's going to happen. You just got to make that line your best. Uh, you know, releases is a lot like improv comedy. If you guys know what improv is where it's like one guy's playing off the other, you got to be on your toes you got to kind of be ready for anything. Um, so I, I think like, because of that, right. I don't teach, I, I do teach specific releases, but I, I don't want you guys to memorize footwork patterns as a, at, at the line of scrimmage for releases, the same way I want you to, to get in and out of routes, because I, I can't, I don't know which, like, you just got to be ready with a, a mentality to adjust to anything. So I give you guys rules and guidelines to kind of build around. And then I got to let you guys figure it out yourself and, and have some free, some freedom to experiment. And this is my whole theory on this. Science plus creativity equals art, right? So me and coach, we give you guys the science, right? I tell you the rules, hey, attack leverage here, aim two yards outside, eat up space, like all the kind of physical science, right? But then it's your job to add creativity. It's your job as the athlete to take those rules and make them your own and spin it into your own work of art, right? Like, like let's say Drake, right? Drake is the hottest fucking musician in the game. Drake isn't the hottest musician in the game because he, he, he performs music just like everyone else always did because he reads the notes off a piece of paper the same way. He's so great because of his individuality, because he has added his own spin on things and his own perception and has done it his way. He's, Drake is his true self. Take any artist, take Beethoven, take fucking Mozart, whatever it is. Those guys took something that existed before and put their own spin on it, and that's why they are legendary. That's why they have a legacy. So don't try to be like anybody else. Don't try to fucking emulate this guy, emulate that guy. Like you have to do what is best for you. So you take the rules, you take the guidelines and, you, and, and like, you know, it, it's, it's tough with coaches because I'll say, Hey, I want you to like on one end, I'm going to say, Hey, listen to me and listen to the fundamentals. But at the other end, like you, you it, it's hard as a player to let a coach who's not playing force you to do something that makes you uncomfortable. Right. So like, it's gotta be comfortable. It's gotta be something you can own. It's gotta be something that you feel good about. If you don't feel good about your art, it's, or your, 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 it's never going to become art. You're never going to get the most out of yourself. And I think, and I think, you know, communication is an important add on to this, that like, there's always got to be constant communication between you and your coaches always. And that, and that way, you know, you are a grown man who's taking ownership of your craft. And if that's the case, 
And that gives you the right as, a, as an adult to go to coach and say, hey, coach, I know you wanted us to do it this way, you know, and have an educated opinion. It makes me uncomfortable. I don't like it. Or I'd like to try this instead. You know, what do you think? And it's an open dialogue. If in the end, you guys have an open dialogue and coach helps you understand why he doesn't want it that way, he wants it another way, then great, you go do that. But don't just do something just because he fucking tells you to do it because then you're not going to take ownership of your craft. You're not, you're not going to, to really like, it's not going to become your art. It's just going to become someone else's art. You're just, you're just copying a painting you've already seen. And that painting's not going to end up in a fucking museum because it's just a replica of somebody else's mind. I want this to be your shit, right? I, like, I, I want to, you become unguardable when you have a secret recipe that nobody else has because no one else can figure it out and they can't fucking use the blueprint to guard you is not the same as the blueprint to guard somebody else. There's, you, you provide some sort of problem that is unique to you because you're maximizing your strengths in a way nobody else has. Like that, that just fucking creativity part is so huge. And it's so hard for coaches to accept because like, fuck, it's pretty scary to give a fucking kid, you know, the, the, the control over this and give myself less control when, when in the end, if that kid doesn't perform, you know, I, I might get fired and have to fucking find a way to provide for my family. Like, that's pretty scary. But, you know, to do it any other way, you just, just we, it, 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 I don't think you can get the most out of your players if you don't allow them to have that creativity. And I, and I think, you know, you guys got to learn the fundamentals, build your game around the fundamentals, but then just fucking experiment. Trial and error, trial and error, and just keep experimenting. All right, this, uh, yeah, we'll go through maybe these three slides and then, all right, so here's probably a pretty good one to, to write down. All right, we, so this is kind of what I was saying, guys, right? Before I even talk about, before I even talk about specific footwork or foot placement or, or any of this stuff, I think there's rules to understand, right? These are characteristics of a good release. You're not going to ever have all 10 of these in one release. Sometimes you might only need to have one of these really well to have a great release. Other times you might need to have four or five. And if you only have three, then that'll like, you know, sometimes you'll just see, it depends on the situation, but I'll talk through all of them. You notice how they're all labeled number one, because they're all just, just like, they're all important. Like I said, any one of these can win you a rep and not having any one of these can lose you a rep if it's at the wrong time. But the first one, which I do think is most important is have a plan. You have to come to the line with a plan, right? It's not just coming up without like, it's not just coming up blind and just fucking playing football and just adjusting your shit on the fly. You dictate the tempo as the receiver. You dictate the pace. You're in control. But you can't be in control if you don't have a plan, right? Like, it's like getting in a car with no directions. You're not going anywhere if you get in a car with no directions. You got to know where you're going first. So have a plan first, meaning you've studied the DB. You know what his weaknesses are. You know how you want to win each route. Like, you have a plan that's built in practice, that's executed. And, and you're not ever using your plan for the first time in a game. It's something you determine in film study. You work with coach to figure out, you work with your teammates to figure out, and then you're practicing it all week. And you come up to the line with a plan and a counter plan. He's lined inside leverage. I'm running a slant. My initial plan is going to be to do this. But in the back of your mind, you also know, well, fuck, if he takes that away, I have the ability to adjust in the fly and go to my counter plan. Okay? Because, again, it's like improv comedy, right? I don't know. I can have a plan and think it's going to work, but I never really know because he's a human being that can, that can do anything. All right, the next one is patient but sudden. And this goes to the control, the tempo kind of theme, right? Patient, always play, patient while executing your plan, sudden when you make your move. Meaning never let a DB force you to rush and always control the tempo. You play at your pace. I was talking to Devontae Adams. Obviously, everyone knows Devontae Adams. And I was asking him about his releases. And he said, Tay never talks about a hezzy release. He never mentions the word hezzy. Or his trainer was telling this to me too. And then Tay, he was like, we don't talk about hezzy. That's just how, that's just the pace I play at. He was like, you know, everyone thinks like, how does, how is Tay so good at the hezzy one step? He's just like, I control the fucking tempo. I play at a pace I'm comfortable with. And when I make my move, I fucking go. But a lot of guys think they have to, for your whole life, right? All your coaches are telling you, get out of your break faster, do this faster, be there faster, be there faster. But then you get to the highest level and you're playing professional football in Germany at the, in, in the best league in the country. And you realize like, oh shit, when I slow down and play with a little bit of patience, that's when I get the most open. And it's totally different to what most of your coaches told you when you were younger. And it's the same here in the States. Everyone, everyone is a young receiver is always encouraged to go faster, faster, faster. And then you get to the highest level and the best way to get open is to slow down. And it's hard for guys. So patient, but sudden, I think is huge. All right. Now we get into some of the real technical release aspects, eat up space, right? We always want to get on the, on the DB's toes. So, you know, if he, you, you want, if he, if he's giving you two yards of space, you want to get a yard and a half and then make your move on his toes, eat up space 
do not leave a lot of space between you and him. All right, attack angles, meaning I don't want to run right at him, okay? I want to run one to two yards outside of him or inside of him, right? Whichever way I want to move him. When I run, when I run, let me, uh, let me go back to me real quick if I can find this. Um, how do I stop the share? All right, real quick, just you guys can see my hand. So if, I, if I'm here, right, or I got I got a DB here. If I just run right at him right here, like I'm not making him move that he's pretty comfortable. He just gets to sit here and fucking get on me and then jack me up. I DBs like to take small steps, boom, 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 and then fucking jack you up. If I aim all the way out here, right, now he's got to take big steps to chase me. And now, I get, now I'm in control, right? When I go here, he's in control. He can sit there and jack me up. I make him chase me out here, I'm in control because now he's chasing me. Right, so he can chase you this way, that way, whatever. Uh, he's chasing me as opposed to here. I'm just running into him. So attacking angles, it gives you control of the route. And now, based on the way he chases you, that gives you information. Is he running hard to cut me off? Well, then boom, I can slip inside. Or is he staying kind of patient while he's chasing me? I can give him a move and stay outside. Right, but you gain all the information by attacking those angles, making him chase you. Right, that that you'll gain the information. You'll take control of the route by attacking angles. Don't ever run right at the guy. But it's another thing that's really uncomfortable. Right, it's hard. You in the playbook, the 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 routes are drawn like this, right? Where they're drawn in a straight line. But how often does the route actually look like that in a game? Pretty much never. Right? Usually it has to go here and then here and then attack its leverage, and then there. So like what I always tell guys, don't run paper routes. Don't run routes the way they're drawn in the playbook. You've got to be willing to add some creativity to get open and, and use different rules. Very rarely does a route look like this. There's always gonna be stems or change of speed or something else to it. So don't run paper routes. Um, is that sharing it now? It is, right? Yeah, it is. All right. Um, so violent insteps. Hopefully you guys have seen that. If you've seen the duck walk, some of those things playing on the inside part of your foot. Um, here, you know what? Let me, let me pull up the, uh, this will help more. Everybody lost the duck walk in practice. Yeah. So the, yeah, you guys know that. So, so here's like some good examples of violent insteps. Um, here's a quick good one. So like right here, right? So watch him play on the inside part of his foot. See what I'm saying? Low to lower, knee inside my ankle. And I know you guys know that's what we work on with the duck walk. But see his left foot? See that knee inside my ankle right there? And watch how that left foot propels him inside. That's that hip shift inside, playing on your insteps, on the inside part of your foot. That's really important that you're playing, you learn how to play on the inside part of your foot. Right? Pushing off low to lower, that's what creates that hip shift without getting too wide. Pushing off the inside part of your foot. Right here's the duck walk we do, just a good warm up exercise. All right, so I think I think we got we got that one. Let me just share the desktop. That's probably easier. All right, good. All right, next one. This goes without saying, but but combat hands. All right, violent hands. You're like a boxer. Okay, so I love this comparison to a boxer. We are counter punchers in the line of scrimmage. Right, we are not looking for contact. Watch them all counter punchers. We're not looking to create contact. Let them make the first punch, and then we're countering off it. Here comes Jalen Ramsey. He's going to shoot his hands. I have a trained technique. He shoots two hands. I shoot two hands. Boom, I'm a counter puncher. I win. Let him open himself up. Because what happens when DB, the same way a big puncher, if he throws a big punch, he leaves his chest wide open, right? When DBs throw their hands, 99% of the time they stop their feet. And when they stop their feet, they're very vulnerable. So let them shoot their hands and stop their feet. Now you've got them where you want them. Just be ready to get their hands off right away, right? Like a boxer, let him shoot his hands, boom, boom, give himself away, and then I got the counter punch right there as he makes himself vulnerable. All right, so we can go through all the techniques a different time, but I just want that, that philosophy of counter puncher and like a boxer, meaning I'm not wide with my hands. Boxers never, th they, they, boxers never want to throw big haymakers. They want everything to be tight to their chest. They're protecting their body. All right, feet always staggered. Here's an interesting one. Now, it's pretty hard to do. It's hard to have feet always staggered. But if I was going to tell you to push a bus up a hill, if I said you have to push this bus up the hill, the first thing you would do is put one foot behind the other and lower your base. Right? You would never try and push a bus up a hill with your feet side by side. You'd have your feet like this, like the receiver is in a stance right here. That's your most powerful position. All right? So as we watch this, right here, he gets parallel. He's not staggered. If the DB shocked him in the chest right now with his feet parallel, he's going to fall over because he has no base to him, right? Everyone, everyone understand that? On top of that, he comes parallel. Look where his next step is. See this left foot? He's got to step out and around, out and around. He's bubbling this too much. 
because his feet come parallel. Now look what happens when we come, when we come, when we come uh, staggered. Here's Dewan. Watch what happens now when he comes staggered. One, two. See how they're staggered? Now, if he punches me in the chest, he's got a pretty good base. See how we have some base underneath us? We'll be able to absorb that. Our feet are staggered. Now look at his left foot. See how that foot is directly vertical now? And now I can shave his shoulder and get vertical right away. Everyone see the difference? See the difference between this, where now I have to go out and around to the side, right? And I'm not powerful, whereas this, I can shave his shoulder right away because my feet are staggered. Everyone see that difference? I would say, I don't want to say it's the least important one of all these. I don't, I don't, I don't want to say any of them are least important, but I'd say it's one that I, I do think it's probably the least important one. I have a question. Yeah. Would you say you would uh, apply this for receiver blocking as well? Yes, absolutely. That's a, that fucking absolutely. So I talk about power stepping and we talk about power stepping for blocking. I want your feet staggered and your, your, your inside leg should be up. Right. So let me, uh, just so I can, uh, stop share. So let's say your inside leg should be up. So if the ball is in here, right? Your inside leg should be up and this inside leg should be driving through his crotch, right? So I want to, I want to take that, that inside knee and keep power stepping, pounding my feet in the ground and drive that through his crotch. But same shit with that good staggered base. because That's where you're most powerful. If he tries to ragdoll you and your feet are parallel, he's going to throw you down. But if your feet are staggered, you can keep that base and keep that upper body strength. Okay, but there still is a time where we have to square up so we don't like overshoot or miss him. Or so, so when you get up to him, you'll be kind of you'll be square, right? And then once I get contact, then that's when I want to try and stagger my feet. And then I want right. to put him in that powerful base. So okay. what I'll say is first thing you do is want to play basketball. I'm I'm square and I'm shuffling to stay in front, right? So you have a two way go. But then once I make contact with them, I want to get that inside foot up and start to power step with that staggered base. I see. Okay. Thank you. Great question. Um. What else am I looking for right here? All right. Uh, so understanding the DB's body language and leverage kind of goes without saying, right? Kind of, kind of like have a plan, but understand if he's inside leverage, he's inside leverage for a reason. Why is he there? He's there to protect the inside. Why is he there to protect the inside? Well, they might be bringing pressure, right? Because all the inside help is leaving because they're blitzing the quarterback. That'd be good to know. Or, you know, maybe it's whatever the fuck the reason is like that's based on the, the defense, but DB's don't just line the same way coach tells you, hey, line up on the hash on this play. Line up two inside the numbers on this play. Line up on the bottom of the numbers this play. DBs have the same rules. Hey, on this coverage, line up outside leverage. On this coverage, line up inside leverage. So if you can figure out why they're lining up with different leverages, you can figure out how to exploit that. Oh, you want to protect your inside? Fuck you. I'm going to threaten your inside right now because you don't fucking exist. And you're a DB and your life is sad. And I feel bad for you. And I'm just going to keep making you miserable. You don't, you don't want me to go inside? I'm going to go inside right now and threaten your most prized possession because I'm the receiver and I control everything and you have no control over me at all, right? So understanding his body language, understanding his leverage, right? Uh, Doug Baldwin, I don't know if you guys know but Doug Baldwin, really good receiver for the Seahawks. He talked about how he would study the way corners walk around in between plays. Think about this. He would study the way a corner, his body language, talk about a silent movie. He would study a corner's body language in between plays. And when he was studying Josh Norman, he learned when Josh Norman wanted to play really aggressive press coverage, his body language would change before the play. He would get really excited. He'd start jumping around. He'd have a little more pep to his step, and then he would go and fucking jam you hard. When he was playing more of a calm, collected press coverage, he was more, he was, you know, just more chill in between plays, just his normal self. Again, understanding DB body language and leverage. There's no, there's no end to the advantages you can gain on the field, right? Like, like, like Kobe Bryant used to say that – Kobe used to say that he used to study where the refs would align on a basketball court because he would know – if he knew the positioning of the refs, he knew, hey, in the lower block, there's no ref down there, and I can get away with holding. I know I, I can punch this guy in the ribs over and over, and no one's going to see it. Is, it. is it cheating? Like, fuck no. It's just fucking using the rules to your advantage and finding, and finding a fucking edge by any means necessary. Right? So same shit. Like, it, people, most people will tell you, like, you're a fucking loser. You're wasting your time for watch, watching a DB walk around in between a play. But guess what? If I learn when he's going to press me aggressively or not, it wasn't a waste of time at all. I'm going to win the game because of that shit. So study that shit, understand his body language and leverage. Um, <laughs> similar to, I don't have a film for it, but similar to, to uh, keeping your feet staggered, one foot always grounded, right? We don't want to hop. The minute we hop, A, if we hop, we can't change direction. The minute both feet leave the ground, if I, if I hop and a DB shoots one way, I can't automatically redirect because both feet are, at, are, are not are off the ground. So I can't do anything. And if he punches me in the chest when I leave the ground, I have no power to me. 
So it goes without saying, just never hop. Always, to, it's one, two. It's powerful steps. It's never two steps at the same time. It's always one step than the other. Two, and that's how you keep your feet staggered. That's how you keep a good base. Like all those things, one foot, then the other, never hop. All right. And then the last thing that we, I think we have a quick video for. The last thing is low to lower. All right. I start in a good low athletic stance, right? So you see Taylor Gabriel here. He's in a pretty good low athletic stance. When the ball snap, I play with an even lower pad level. Low to lower. See his pad level sinking. Nothing good athletic. No, there's never been a good athletic move other than maybe grabbing a rebound or like a jump ball that happens when you're standing straight up, right? You never want to be straight up. That doesn't help you move. A, so so the, you want to play low to lower. We don't want to come any higher than this. Low to lower. That's my most explosive position. Low to lower. So here, here's a good one, right? A good low athletic stance. And now when I make my move, I come off low to lower. Watch his pad level dip lower. And now when I run, my pad level stays that high. I don't raise up. Low to lower. Right, so it's just a good little fucking phrase um, just to depict like you, you want to start in a low athletic pad level and everything should be lower after that. Um, there's, you know, a lot of guys think they're confusing DBs when they raise up and then come back down. Like all you're doing is looking silly. When you raise up, the DB knows if you got to make a move, you have to come back down to do anything because nothing good happens athletic when you're standing straight up. So like that cute shit versus a good DB, go ahead and raise up. I'm just going to fucking relax because I know that you're in no position to beat me because if I'm any good, like, I'm not going to get beat by a fucking stiff athlete who's standing up. If you watch Devontae Adams, something he does great when he hesitates, he's always low. He's always playing basketball. You never see a point guard dribbling straight up, right? He's always low with the ball so he can move side to side at all times. Same shit for us. Um, so I think next time, guys, and I know that's a lot, so I'll, I'll stay on for a couple more minutes if you guys have questions, but next time I'd like to go over more of the specific releases. Um, more than specific releases, and we can get some other stuff too. Uh, I got one more thing I got I to gotta show you guys. La last point on the releases before I let you go. Um, here's the last one. So our mentality, right? Here's the last thing. I got to make this a release commandment. I got to change my command. I might actually take off the feet always staggered and put this. Don't worry about the, the different sports shit because I know, I know like in Germany, I don't know how much you guys watch baseball. I don't know how big basketball is. But essentially, you got to make all the releases look the same, Okay. Like, I don't need to be super quick or super fast if the DB doesn't know what I'm doing. So if I have an inside release, I better have an outside release that looks the same, right? And then if I have an inside, if I have an outside release, I better have another outside release that looks the same, but it plays one off. So it's pairing those releases together, making them all look the same. You can kind of see it in this video right here. Just watch the gather step, that little gather step he takes behind, and look how all these releases look the same. A gather step and one wide step. Gather, one wide step, I finish inside. Gather, one wide step, boom, boom, I finish outside. Same thing here. One wide step, finish outside. But it all looks the same. And now gather at his fucking speed release. Right? I'm a big baseball guy. And to me, this makes me think of a pitcher. Right? Pitchers will throw one pitch. And real quick, you guys can take notes for a second. I want to make sure you guys understand this. Pitchers don't just, like, pitchers don't just throw a pitch just to fucking, like, get a strike. Hold on one sec. Like a lot of times pitchers will waste pitches or throw a pitch to set up the next pitch, right? So if I'm a pitcher in baseball, I'm trying to strike out the best hitter. I might throw a ball that's low and outside five times in a row just so I can then hit him with the high and inside fastball when he's not expecting it. I'm lulling, lulling him to sleep. So you might take a shitty release on a run play, three run plays in a row, just to set him up for the one where you want to kill him. So here's the low and out. Here's the changeup outside, right? Boom, boom. There's my changeup. Now I'm setting him up. I'm setting him up. Here's my big curveball. Right now, this is keeping him off balance. Oh, you thought it was a changeup? No, I'm hitting you with a big curveball, but it looks the same. Same tempo, same body language. And now you're sitting on all the off speed stuff. You're sitting on all the slow stuff. Now, fuck you. I'm just going to run by you. Here comes that high fastball. And this is why DBs live such a sad life. Like, if we have a plan like this, how the fuck are they going to do it? Like, they are, DBs are running a race backwards and blindfolded with no directions. DBs are, run, are playing the game backwards and blindfolded with no directions. You should never fucking lose. Like, it is never okay for a receiver to lose a rep. If I told you right now we were going to run a fucking 100-yard uh, dash, and, and I was running forward, and you were running backwards, and I knew where I was going, you had a blindfold on, who do you think would win? The guy running forward who knows where he's going, right? That's literally what playing receiver versus DB is. You know where the route's going. You know when the ball's going to be snapped. You know everything, and he's just fucking chasing you at your mercy. The only way he ever beats you is because you fuck something up. Not because he beat you, 
DBs never beat you, only because you fuck something up. The only time I'll say a DB beats you is those fucking tough, scrappy guys who get into your chest and might punch you in the fucking mouth. And, and some of you fucking receivers just aren't built for that shit. Like, yeah, it's just the truth. And, like, you got to fucking be able to match his physicality. Like, some of those guys, that's how DBs dictate the tempo, right? If I'm a DB, I'm going to dictate the tempo by punching you in the face. Okay, I know it's a lot harder. Like, how much do you guys love receivers and uh, DBs that don't use hands? It's fucking routes on air, right? But, if, if, but at that point, like, you should never fucking lose, bro. Once you get rid of the hands, it's routes on air. You have, just have a fucking dog chasing you. You have a man chasing you who has no idea where the fuck he's going. You say stop, he's going to stop three seconds later. And then the ball's caught and you're fucking scoring a touchdown. Like, there's nothing he can do if your technique is sound, if you make shit look the same, and if you're fucking playing like a savage. Um, but that's what I got for today, guys. That was a fucking – that was a good one. <laughs> Any questions, guys? No, that was fucking awesome, Coach, man. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad. I feel like right now. <laughs> <laughs> I wish we could go fucking on the practice field right now and then go get this shit right. <laughs> Try to shave a right now and just meet him there. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> that, yo, that's what we should do. If you guys don't end up playing, we should just set up one big fucking, like, <laughs> like one big fucking event. Sideline hustle sponsored event. Shave a versus free play. Let's go. <laughs> All marbles. <laughs> I saw any questions? Uh, yeah, I got one question. I had a question. Coach? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Max, 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 Max. Yeah. Uh, you were showing a lot of clips with the where they like false step the receivers. We're getting taught a lot that we shouldn't false step. What's your take on that? So I don't believe I believe you're I believe you're talking about this gap. Yeah, like the gather the gather step, but also with the with the front foot. With the what? The front foot. Where were they false stepping with the front foot? Uh the 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 Chiefs clip, I think. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, if it's with the front foot, I'm not, I'm not, I don't, I don't, I don't like that. I don't, I never like a, like, it happens in the NFL. It's going to happen. Hold on, sorry. Let me fucking, you guys can see this, right? So it happens in the NFL where, where you're going to fall step and, and whatnot. Uh, and it just happens at all levels of football. I don't think this gather step is a fall step versus press. I, when he takes this gather step, right, look how much wider Devontae can get. See that position right there? He can now push off with so much more width. See how wide that foot is? He couldn't do that for if his foot didn't come behind him. So if it's first press and right here, I'm gaining information, right? I'm taking a split second. Like, watch this next one. He's already – watch this. I just take this gather step and the DB's flinching. I haven't gone anywhere. He's already flinching. So I, I, I'm gaining information off how he wants to play me, and, and it helps it time up. So in my opinion, this back foot versus press is not, a, is not a false step if you use it the right way. If you're just taking off on a go ball, right, you're just running vertical – and you take this gather step, that is a false step, right? Versus loose coverage. If you don't need it, it's a false step. So that front foot you were talking about, the front foot is definitely a, is definitely a false step. I, I'm, I'm curious to know where that, where that one was. Um, but I understand what you're saying. Like that front foot, you always want to try and roll off your front foot. Um, you know, and that's why I'm a big believer in doing stance and start every single day. I, in my early days as a coach, I always thought the back foot gather was a false step. And it wasn't until I started working with NFL guys And they're like, no, no, no. Like, listen, bro, I'm not, do I'm not doing this because I'm fucking sloppy. Like, I'm, I'm a fucking professional. Here's why I'm doing this. I, my shoulders stay square, but I have more leverage now to push off and get with, and I can gain information on the DB. And it's a way to pair something together, right? I can gather step and speed release. I can gather step and one step stretch inside. I can, I can gather step and one, two, right? But that gather step gives them the same rhythm and makes everything feel the same, and then you can play off it. But as soon as he's not pressed, as soon as he's not challenging you and you're taking a gather step, now you're just wasting time and that is a false step. You guys understand that difference? Yes, sir. Yeah. Brandon, what were you going to say? You got a question? Yeah, uh, I know a couple guys had the same question. Um, do you have any advice on how to avoid traffic and uh, block downfield? Say it again, avoid traffic. <laughs> How to avoid traffic and also how to block downfield. Any advice? Yeah, so this is the, it, we're going to have to get into this more next time because I could like I literally I have a whole presentation on, on blocking. But let me let me touch on it quick and then it'll have to be like the fucking trailer for the movie you want to see and you have to come back next week. Uh, but but I'll I'll get to I'll get to a few things quick. <laughs> and then so so avoiding traffic. The answer is attacking angles, right? That, that, that release thing. That, the answer is attacking angles. So we're going to look at this right here. 
All right, so let's watch his angles right here, okay? This is what I call – this, this is like one of the first tapes I ever made, so the editing is kind of older. Hold on. Sorry, this is too shitty for me. Uh, my fault. This one's better. You can see this? All right, so watch the angles he's taking. So you're talking about avoiding traffic. See how he's coming all the way out here? Now the DB's got to make a decision. How does he want to play me? A, I'm making him chase me, and I'm making him take big steps, and now he's off balance. But B, is he going to come slow to me or come fast to me? And whatever he does, he's wrong. So he's kind of patient, right? So now I make him – I attack the angles. I make him chase me, and now he's off balance. I give him a move back inside, and I can win outside. Just by attacking those angles, and now I can get that free release and kind of avoid traffic. Let's say vice versa. Same angle, right? Everyone see the same angle going just as wide. But now he comes a little harder. I feel like I can slip inside him. Boom, I use the momentum against him. I'm inside him. If I just run straight at him, then, like, he doesn't feel uncomfortable ever. If I just run straight at him, he doesn't have to move his feet, and I'm not going to avoid traffic because he can just grab me. But right now, like, he's more uncomfortable than I am. He doesn't like taking these big, these big shuffles. I like running normally like this. You know what I'm saying? Like, he doesn't like this. So the first thing to me, and I hope, I hope, Brandon, this is what you meant by avoiding traffic, is just attack angles, make him chase you, and whatever he does, he's wrong. Does that, that make sense? Did I answer your question on that one? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right. Appreciate you. Yeah, and then let me, let me get to the I'll, – I'll show you one run, run drill real quick. And then, unfortunately, I got to run because I got uh, – can, can I add something to that? Yeah, um, I would work for any route that is uh, – where you don't have the time to hesitate for, like, any seams or split, split routes. Uh, I would say on a seam, you do it's not necessarily hesitating, it's just attacking angles. Doesn't mean you have to hesitate, but like on a seam, if you run, like, let me see what I can find. I, on a seam, right? So if you're here, if I run out here, I'm just sprinting. If he doesn't fucking run out with me to cut me off, I'm just gonna keep finishing outside of him. But if I run here and he does sprint to cut me off, it's just one step inside and finish inside at full speed, right? So the angles thing doesn't have to, you don't have to pair attack angles with change of speed. You can attack angles at full speed, right? And that's something you have to know. How much time do you have in this concept? If it's a red zone fade, you're never going to get sacked in a red zone fade. You have all the time in the world to take good release and attack angles and be patient. But if it's a fucking 12-yard corner route, then, yeah, you got to go. You don't have as much time to fuck around. So you, that's kind of like getting on the same page with your quarterback. And now, listen, the Frankfurt receivers have different time than the a different team's receivers based on how good your offensive line is and who your quarterback is. So, like, it, it varies on the program. You got to get on the same page with where your quarterback wants you to be. But I would say that you generally have more time than you think. And the other thing I would say is you, you guys do one-on-ones with the DBs. Use yeah. one-on-ones as your time to experiment. Right? Everyone says one-on-ones aren't realistic, all this shit. A lot of times they can't be. Like, a lot of times they aren't. But that's your time to experiment. That's your time to try taking a wide angle and fuck it up and have coach say, what the fuck are you thinking? Why would you run all the way to the sideline? But at least you know, like, all right, fuck, that was too far. And that's just as valuable. Figuring out what doesn't work is just as valuable as, as figuring out what does work. But if, if, you, if you go into one-on-ones and you're too scared and you, you're just going in there saying, fuck, I hope coach doesn't yell at me. I don't want to fuck this up. You're never going to grow. You're never going to experiment and grow and try shit. Like, you've got to go into one-on-ones willing to fail. Because who gives a fuck how many one-on-one reps you win? It has nothing to do with real football. That's when you go in and you're willing to try shit. You're willing to fail. And then you say, oh, shit, like, that fucking shit I just tried was dope. Now let me try that in seven-on-seven. Seven. Oh, it worked on seven-on-seven. Seven. Now let me try that in team. Like, but if you don't fucking try and experiment first, then you're just doing the same thing over and over, and, you, and you're just the same player you've always been. That makes sense on, on kind of the, the – like, so don't think that just, I, and this is why it's uncomfortable, right? You're, you're used to running routes like this, but just because it's drawn like this doesn't mean you, I, I'm, I promise you, you can afford to go here a little bit, make a move. And as long as you get, the quarterback needs you to be here. When you're, when all the, all the quarterback cares that you're in the spot where you need to be when he's ready to throw you the ball. I don't give a fuck if you roll on the ground and do a fucking, a, a somersault. As long as you get up and you're where you need to be when the, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, it really doesn't matter how you get there. The time, timing is more important than anything else. Be where the quarterback expects you when he expects you to be there on time. How you get there, that's your creative process. And coach is going to work with you on, hey, the way Brandon gets there versus the way Max gets there versus the way Nico gets there. Like that, it might all be different for your game, right? And that's how, that's where the individual creativity comes into play. But the framework, the rules of attack angles, eat up space, all that shit, that stays consistent. The way you apply them is, is individual. 
Uh, real quick, let me show you this, this run blocking drill so you guys can do this until next time we talk, and then, uh, and then I got to be out. So this is, this is my guy, Zabasco. Um, this is the, the kid, Luke, who came with me to, uh, to Europe when I was out there. So this is a simple run progression drill. So the first one, we're just going to target our hands. Okay, the next one, we're going to target our hands and bring them in tight, and, and the third progression, we're going to run our feet. All right, so again, the first one is just getting my hands to his breastplate. Violent, right? Targeting my hands to his eyes, that's it. Or my hands to his breastplate. The second one, I want to bring him in tight. So I don't want any space between me and him. I want to pull him in tight and get my chest to his chest. All right, now if he does lock out like this, right? Lock out like this. I want to chop his elbows. That's, that's where a weakness, his elbow. Chop his elbows down and replace. And now I'm taking that space out again. All right, if I let him stay wide, if I let him stay like this, he can see and he can ragdoll me. Like if I was going to tell you to carry a heavy box, right? You would never carry it with your arms fully extended. You would bring it in close to your chest. That's where you have the most power. So if you want to block him, you want to bring him in close to your chest. That's where you have the most power. When your arms are extended, right? When your arms are extended, that's a holding hold. This grabbing on his breastplate is not. As long as my, my, my hands are inside my framework, that's not a holding hold. That's a holding hold. That's a holding hold. You, you understand me? This is not. And that's where you have the most strength, too. I'm stronger here using my chest, using my hips, using everything than I am just using my, my triceps out here. All right. So, and then, and then now let's watch the feet. All right. So, this is, you guys kind of see him taking the air out. Okay. I want to watch this, this rep with, with Nestor and, and Luke and everything. Right, so there's good location, right? Now watch him take the air out. My chest to his chest, and then watch his feet. See how he's trying to, see how his feet are staggered, keeping those feet in the ground, trying to drive. See how he's trying to drive this front knee through his crotch? Trying to drive this front knee through his crotch, keep those feet staggered. All right, let's watch Luke one more time. This is the last one. Hands, good. Now hands and feet, bring him in tight. Hands, feet, make him miss, good. See how that wide base, right? Wide base is key. And it, you're not always going to get the feet staggered. Like, you got another grown man battling against his will. It's not always going to be pretty. But he's trying. He's trying to stagger those feet and move that, get those feet staggered, staggered. He could actually do a better job of that. But the wide base is good. His hands are good. And bring him in tight. Keep running your feet. You know, and then, and then, and then the only other thing to add to this, right, is like, what do I do if he's eight yards off? You literally just close the space. You get to six yards. You get two yards away from him, and you do that drill. Right? If he's eight yards off, I run to about two yards before him. I shuffle to stay in front, and then once he makes, once he declares where he wants to go, I get into his pad and I do that exact drill. Run up to him, play basketball defense, and then finish it with that drill right there. You guys good? Yes, sir. So, guys, we're gonna do some more meetings. I think it was planned as one time, but we're gonna do some more, get more into the technical stuff and shit like that. So, um, uh, coach, appreciate talking to us. I mean, great stuff. I think everybody learned a lot. And could you stay on for a minute so we can talk how we, how we go on with that? And uh, do, could you stay on for a minute? Yeah. yeah the guys leave so we can talk how we, how we go on with that. Yeah, yeah no doubt. No doubt. Yeah. Well, thanks, guys, for joining us. Hey, thank you, guys. All, all thank the guys you. Thank you. Thank you, Coach. Thank you, Coach. Thanks, Coach. Thank you, coach. Thanks, coach. Coach, appreciate, appreciate it. it. Thank I you, know. guys. Thanks for coming yeah. on. If you, if you guys need anything, just hit up Coach. He's got direct access to me. So, If you have questions, just let them know. Also, mach's gut, Jungs. Hau rein. Ciao. Ciao. Ciao.